So hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. I'm Robin Garrow. I'm the president of the Graduate Center of the City University of New York, and it is my great pleasure to welcome you to the 2021 Otto and Fran Walter Memorial Lecture with Federica Mogherini, hosted by our European Union Study Center. The Graduate Center is the primary doctoral granting institution of the multi-campus City University of New York, the nation's largest urban public university. This year, we celebrate our 60th birthday. The Graduate Center is the home of Nobel and Pulitzer Prize winning scholars, and we are dedicated to fostering research that advances the public good. We host more than 20, sorry, 30 centers and institutes that explore some of today's most pressing issues through provocative conversations and groundbreaking research. Our home in New York City, one of the world's most cosmopolitan cities encourages a wide mix of ideas and viewpoints on a broad range of domestic and international issues. The European Union Study Center is directed by today's host and moderator, John Torpy, a professor of sociology and history. The center encourages a rich exchange of ideas by bringing together scholars and professionals from the US and Europe. Today's event is part of a series of lectures and conversations that the center will hold throughout the year. Today's event features Federica Mogherini. She is the rector of the College of Europe and co-chair of the United Nations High Level Panel on Internal Displacement, positions she assumed in early 2020. Prior to that, for five years, Ms. Mogherini served as the High Representative of the European Union for Foreign Affairs and Security Policy and as Vice President of the European Commission. Prior to joining the EU, she served as the Italian Minister for Foreign Affairs and International Cooperation, and as a member of the Italian Chamber of Deputies. I'd now like to introduce the Vice President of the Otto and Fran Walter Foundation, Martha Peak. We are very grateful to the Walter Foundation for its general support of this annual lecture series. Ms. Peak will introduce today's speaker, and will say a few words about the late Otto and Fran Walter, their interests, and the foundation's commitment to supporting programs like this one. Welcome, Marty, and thank you again to everyone for joining us today. Thank you so much. Dr. Otto L. Walter was born in Munich and entered the bar in Germany just in time for his law credentials to be stripped from him on account of his religion. As a result, in the mid 1930s, he fled Europe and found a new home in New York City. 20 years later, he had saved enough to go to law school a second time, requisite to entering the bar in this country. Upon graduation, he started his own law firm and he did well in his legal career. During his lifetime, Otto and his wife, Fran, became philanthropists and Otto never forgot where he came from or what had happened in his home country. He was well aware that the possibility of fascism can crop up anywhere, and he made it his life's work to promote peace and humanitarianism across neighborhoods and across national borders. It is in this spirit that during his lifetime, Dr. Walter underwrote a European Union Study Center annual lecture designed to increase, to increase conversation and understanding between Europeans and Americans. And since Dr. Walter's death in 2003, the charitable foundation that bears his name has been delighted to continue this work and to amplify our relationship with the Graduate Center, and in this small way, help support the work of increased transatlantic mutual understanding. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Martha Peak. Thank you so much for those kind remarks. Uh, I wanna thank Robin Garrell, the recently arrived president of the Graduate Center for her support of this event. Uh, my name is John Torpy. I'm director of the Ralph Bunch Institute uh, for International Studies and of the EU Study Center. I therefore also wanna thank Meryl Sovner, associate director of the EU Study Center, Eli Koretny and Hristo Voinov of the Ralph Munch Institute team for all their help in making this event possible. 
I especially want to thank the Otto and Fran Walter Foundation for their steadfast support of the activities of the EU Studies Center at the Graduate Center and of the annual Europe Day lecture in particular. Yes, we had originally planned to do this back in May, but uh, shall we say events overtook our plans. Still, this is normally a festive occasion, so I urge you if you are so inclined and in an appropriate time zone to grab a glass of Prosecco while you enjoy the conversation. I now want to express our special thanks to Federico Mogherini for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you all in Zoom land for joining us and let me take this opportunity to remind the audience that if you have questions for the Q&A at the end of our interview, you may insert them along the way in the Q&A, but the chat function is disabled for this event. Thanks again, Federico Mogherini, uh, Rector of the College of Europe. So, uh, Federica, you mm -hmm. Yes, I'm yeah. muted now. Thanks to you. It's great to be with you. And uh, uh, the only regret is that we're not together in person uh, in New York, but uh, uh, it's great to be able to celebrate Europe's Day uh, with, some, with some delay or what's some anticipation together with you uh, and uh, looking forward uh, so much to this exchange today. And thanks again for the invitation and for having set this up even in a virtual uh, landscape uh, we are obliged to respect these days. Right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks again for doing this. So uh, let me turn to uh, the questions that I have for you. Um, I think almost everyone would agree that it's been a difficult four years for transatlantic relations with the last U.S. administration. Indeed, German Chancellor Angela Merkel uh, argued that Europe would have to learn to proceed more on its own and could not rely on the US as a partner as it once almost reflexively had. So to what extent has Europe begun to go its own way in fact? And in what areas do we see Europe and the US diverging? I think, yeah, undoubtedly, uh, there has been uh, uh, some difficulties in this last uh, four years. Um, we had difficulties in previous decades uh, also. So in the history of the transatlantic relations, this was not a complete novelty. Uh, but previous uh, um, tensions or disagreements were uh, always limited to uh, single issues, single policy decisions, uh, even relevant ones, uh, think of the war on Iraq, uh, where the transatlantic community was definitely not on the same page. Uh, but uh, before the Trump administration, I would say that both in the United States and in Europe, there was a general sense of being on the same side of history um, on, on general terms. And there was, as you mentioned, a natural reflex to consult each other, to coordinate actions, sometimes even to have a division of labor and for sure to work uh, on all security uh, and foreign policy issues hand in hand. Uh, obviously investing consistently in our common alliance, uh, NATO. Uh, with the Trump administration, this has dramatically changed. Uh, and for the Europeans, it has been uh, particularly a shock, I think, because it came just after a time, especially a couple of years, uh, last years of the Obama administration, when we, managed to work uh, together uh, across the Atlantic with great results and, and big achievements. Think of the Paris Climate Change Agreements that was really literally done by the United States and the European Union uh, working closely together. Um, the Iran nuclear deal and uh, also in the UN framework the sustainable development goals. So we were coming at a peak of uh, multilateral successes somehow led by uh, the transatlantic uh, partnership uh, and for sure, uh, these last four years have been uh, of a completely different nature. Is there something good in it? Uh, I have to say, and I've lived the transition because I was in office uh, uh, as the EU high representative exactly from uh, 2014 to 2019. So I've seen the, 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 the transition, let's, let's put it this way. I've lived, lived firsthand the shock um, and I've repeated in, I think, an, an incredible number of times that regardless difficulties, we were still friends and partners, but undoubtedly uh, the difficulties were there. The positive side of it is that Europe has learned uh, not to give the United States for granted anymore. Uh, if I can use a, a metaphor, I think that Europeans were used to consider themselves the union partner 
uh, or the, uh, the, the little brother or sister uh, with someone else that at the end of the day would have taken care for good or for bad, huh? because we were also complaining sometimes about US policies or positions, uh, but some somehow we could relax. Uh, the pilot was, was not here. The pilot uh, uh, was, uh, uh, was taking care of the flight, of the route, of the safety of the flight. We were contributing, but uh, we were happy to let uh, somebody else drive. Uh, or, or fly. Uh, with the Trump administration, I think Europeans realized that uh, they had to take responsibility. They had to play uh, autonomously uh, in some uh, issues. They had to defend their own interests and also the values. Um, I think in particular when uh, at, the end, at the time Secretary of State Tillerson mentioned that uh, the US foreign policy would have not been guided by human rights principles anymore. Uh, Europeans realized that they had to take the lead on the human rights oriented uh, foreign policy globally. Europeans realized somehow that they had a responsibility also towards the rest of the world because more and more countries were turning to the European Union for partnerships uh, on issues that before were naturally um, a field of partnership between these third countries and the United States. In the absence of a cooperative United States, uh, many uh, turned towards the European Union. I think that uh, never as in those four years, the European Union has concluded as many trade agreements, for instance, or partnership agreements with uh, the rest of the world from Canada to Japan. Uh, to Australia, you name it, uh, New Zealand, uh, we have found out mm, our power somehow and our responsibility. So I think that yes, indeed, European, Europeans and the European Union specifically has learned to act autonomously, uh, but has kept this instinct of preferring to act together. Uh, and so uh, I hope that now we manage to keep, as we move towards a different kind of partnership uh, and, and relationship with the Biden administration, I hope we in Europe manage to, to keep a sense of, uh, uh, of uh, responsibility and also an awareness of the power we have, uh, not giving up the idea that if needed, we can act autonomously. Uh, and uh, at the same time, preserving or restoring a natural partnership and cooperation with the United States. On one particular thing, I believe the Europeans realized that uh, uh, they had this power, but also the shortcomings and the loopholes we were facing. Uh, and that is the Iran nuclear deal. Maybe we can talk about that more in, uh, in the coming um, hour. But uh, uh, that was a moment when, when Trump announced that the United States would have stepped out of the agreement. That was a moment when Europeans realized that they had a global responsibility and even a responsibility towards parts of the United States to keep the agreement alive, even in the absence of a presence and a commitment from the US administration. And it worked to a certain extent, but then we realized that our autonomy was missing one fundamental element. And that was the instrument of the capacity to protect the um, European investments uh, or trade relations from the extraterritorial impact, for instance, of uh, the US sanctions. This is something we've experienced both in the case of Iran, but also with Cuba, uh, where the shift policy uh, from the Obama administration to the Trump administration was uh, dramatic. Uh, and also there, Europeans kept the course, uh, kept relations and commitment with the Cuban, um, with, with Cuba. Uh, but we realized that our financial system was exposed so much uh, to the US one. Uh, that our autonomy in the financial sector was seriously um, limited. Uh, so I think that this might be the next chapter uh, just to get ready in case uh, things go wrong again uh, or get difficult again. Um, so that for instance, we can use the Euro as a currency worldwide for global exchanges, something that at the moment is not really used. Uh, think of the oil uh, uh, trade that is done completely on, on dollars. Uh, I, I believe that this is going to be the next chapter for the European Union autonomy. But politically, we've realized that, uh, yes, we have a responsibility and we can stand on our own feet. But again, we prefer not to do it. We prefer to work in partnership, uh, especially with the United States. Right. I mean, there are certain ways in which uh, everyone is expecting, I think, the Biden administration to uh, restore, you know, the good old days of uh, comity and uh, brotherhood between, uh, you know, the Europeans and the Americans. 
Um, and they're bringing, he's bringing many of the people that, you know, came from the Obama administration into the new administration with him. Some of them go back indeed to the Clinton administration. Um, and one can sort of understand perhaps that desire for a certain kind of stability and a return to old comfortable ways. But I wonder whether there also aren't also certain, you know, uh, pitfalls in that kind of approach. Um, you know, the world is not the same world that, uh, you know, existed when those administrations were in power. And one wonders whether there might not be a need for new views of things, new, a new orientation to the world. And the Brexit uh, situation is obviously one of the most significant ones that suggests that we're in a kind of different context. So how would you uh, address that question? I think there's um, the, the perception of, uh, or, or the, um, the comfort zone, that's this idea of a return to, uh, to the golden age or to the past, or just back to normal, uh, is, is very tempting, uh, obviously. And uh, um, I think the surface of uh, things suggests that uh, there is a, a certain tendency to, to give reassuring messages. I, I found, for instance, the speech of the inauguration day, uh, very, um, uh, very reassuring, very, um, yes, comfortable and not surprising. Uh, maybe not, not so exciting as uh, one could have imagined, but extremely uh, sound, extremely solid and extremely reassuring. Uh, but I think that beyond, beyond the surface, uh, the real point is that there is no back to normal um, that is even imaginable or possible because there is no normal anymore. <laughs> The world has completely changed in this last, well, even in this last year, uh, it's completely changed. If we had this conversation uh, in, uh, in January last year, it would have been a completely different world and we wouldn't have had it on, online, but in, in presence. Um, and if you look at the world of five, six, even four years ago, it's a completely different world. So I think that uh, the Biden administration will have a mix of uh, uh, reassuring messages and reassuring symbolism uh, including the choice of some, I think, of the State Department, that is uh, uh, obviously um, one of the main focuses we have in Europe, um, where we recognize friends, let's put it this way, and friends that know Europe well. Uh, but also, I think that um, there will be no back, uh, back to normal uh, in the policies, uh, because in the meantime, some things, for good or for bad, have changed in, in the reality uh, of the world. Uh, some things are changed, have changed because of uh, uh, different factors. Think of the pandemic, think of global change, uh, climate change uh, as, as a priority that for sure four, five, six years ago was already there, but not before. But then there are also some of the choices, for instance, that the Trump administration has taken uh, that change in reality the landscape in which the new administration is called to take decisions and take action. Think of the decision, for instance, to withdraw troops from Afghanistan, uh, I guess that the uh, new administration will have to study carefully the file and understand together with the NATO allies what to do with that. Because uh, it, 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 in certain issues, especially the, the military domain, um, it is not irrelevant the starting point you are in. And uh, uh, you cannot uh, uh, take decisions on the basis of theoretical uh, principles only. You have also to uh, see what is the uh, the damage control uh, conditions uh, you have to put in place in some cases. So I think we will not have a, um, a comfort zone to go back to. Um, I think that the domestic US uh, political dynamics will also not allow that to happen completely. I guess that President Biden will, uh, and the administration in general, will uh, try to start from or focus on uh, um, the uh, less controversial, less dividing, uh, more bipartisan uh, steps in foreign policy, at least, uh, to start with, uh, to try and uh, mend the wounds of, uh, uh, of uh, uh, harsh divisions uh, in the past. Uh, I guess they will have to take their time also because the transition has not really taken place. So I, I think we will have a, um, a, slow, um, a, a slow redefinition of, uh, of the framework we have. Uh, and I guess and I hope that the European Union and uh, um, Europe in general and the United States will sit down together and go through priorities, maybe redefine also respective roles 
there might be issues on which uh, this administration might not be willing to lead, uh, but might be happy to have others leading and, and support. Um, I think maybe of the Middle East uh, or North Africa, where uh, we desperately need to work together, uh, but not necessarily we need uh, uh, the US to, to be in the driving seat, uh, but we need the US to be present and on board. So I think that there will be a, a sort of mapping of priorities, um, uh, sharing notes of uh, where, uh, where to start from, uh, what kind of approaches to take. Uh, and I hope we'll see some, um, some coordination, some effective coordination on that. But I don't think that uh, that will be a simple uh, going back to the comfort zone as before. There might be uh, elements of friction, but what will change, and this, yes, is a comfort zone, a positive one for Europeans, is the change in attitudes overall. What we've suffered the most in Europe, and not only in Europe, because I know that this has been a, a critical and, and difficult uh, element for many in the world, has been that in the, in the four years of the Trump administration, the logic, the, the, the general attitude um, towards international relations was a zero-sum game one. So the, the president was clear, I win and I want you to lose. That is the point. Uh, and this has never been the approach, traditional approach of the United States in foreign policy. Uh, the United States have always understood that investing in partnerships and cooperation worldwide was the best investment on its own safety, prosperity, even economic interests. Uh, and so has always invested in partnerships and, and uh, multilateral approaches. In this respect, I think that yes, there will be a going back to before uh, that has always gone um, this way, regardless of uh, Republican or Democratic uh, uh, administrations. The US approach has always been one of reaching out to partners and, and working together. Uh, I think that in that respect, yes, uh, the, the by default approach will be a partnership and cooperation approach rather than um, a confrontational one uh, or a competitive one, which is the thing we've suffered the most. And in a, in a very basic manner, sometimes diplomacy is also based on uh, very basic things, as Kissinger was saying, the telephone number. Um, now, the telephone number of Europe is clear. Um, in this last four years, we have wondered what was the telephone number of uh, of, of Washington DC, uh, or maybe there was no one picking up the phone. Uh, for sure that is gone. I, I'm sure that now the consultation, the exchange of the ideas and informations will be constant and, uh, uh, and smooth. So uh, there will be someone uh, on, on the other side of the Atlantic to talk to. Then we might not agree on everything, uh, but that is normal. That is, uh, that is uh, absolutely fine. But um, the, the message America is back, I think, is, uh, is, is the most reassuring one we heard. Right. I'm glad to hear that the phone will get answered now. That's certainly reassuring. Um, so, but one area in which it seems to me there is something of a divergence uh, between uh, the U.S. and the European Union uh, has to do with China. And you know, the Trump administration presented a relatively combative face to China, uh, to relatively bipartisan uh, approbation, I would say, uh, for certain good reasons. Um, but I think, you know, the European position has been much more, so to speak, welcoming. That is, uh, you think about the purchase of the port of Piraeus, uh, what's happened in Trieste along the same kinds of lines. I mean, there's a sort of welcoming of the Chinese into the European space in a way that I think is sort of inconceivable in the United States. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you think the Europeans see China and how that may differ from the way Americans see China and what are the implications of that for the relationship? Yes, that's uh, one of the, I think, key issues on which it will be urgent and important uh, to have uh, a transatlantic dialogue. Uh, and I think this has been um, already raised uh, somehow uh, during this, uh, this weeks. Um, I know that the European Union delegation in Washington has already uh, signaled the interest of having a dedicated US-EU 
US-China dialogue, uh, not a, a US, uh, not a trilateral dialogue, uh, a dialogue between the European Union and the United States on their China policies, respectively. Uh, I, I think that today the perception that is there uh, on both sides of the Atlantic is that of a divergent um, approach towards China. In reality, I think uh, uh, this uh, um, is not so diverging uh, as it can uh, be perceived. Uh, but it is the result, uh, th this perception is the result of uh, recent history. Uh, if you allow me to share an anecdote uh, on that, uh, of when I was in office, there was a certain moment when uh, uh, relations between the European Union and China, just after Trump took office, uh, were extremely tense. Uh, we had um, the European Union and China have uh, regular summits uh, at uh, the top level. Um, and uh, we had uh, one of the most uh, dramatic, uh, uh, aggressive uh, um, summits, uh, unconclusive, uh, uh, conflictual, um, really uh, um, a moment of, uh, of despair, uh, I would say. Uh, on uh, uh, something that was extremely conflictual between the European Union and China, um, on top of the many other things that are extremely conflictual between the European Union and China, such as human rights issues. But on that particular case, it was about uh, overproduction of steel. And uh, uh, it was an issue on which the United States had a stake. And the European Union turned towards the United States uh, basically trying to get support for a common policy so that our uh, positions and our requests uh, of a level playing field with China, uh, also including not only over production of steel, but also access to trade and investment, uh, could have been more um, successful uh, and avoiding uh, to have a European Union only approach uh, to these issues, uh, which were uh, in, yeah, stuck in a very difficult negotiation. And exactly that moment, uh, the Trump administration not only didn't join the European Union in, uh, uh, in reaching out uh, to the Chinese and trying to make to pass the same messages that we were asking for or we were really looking for uh, a different kind of attitude of the Chinese authorities, but actually uh, choose not that moment uh, where the European Union was facing difficulties on steel uh, with China, uh, to include, uh, to, to introduce measures against the European Union on steel production. And then the Chinese turned towards us, the Europeans, and, and told us, are you sure these are your friends? Because actually they are attacking you much more than we are. And you have to take in mind that that moment of shock that was at the top level was, was confronting prime ministers and presidents of the 28 at the time, and, and not only the leaders of the European Union, um, Introducing the Europeans a feeling of uh, being exposed. Um, our shoulders were exposed. The, the American allies and friends were actually including the European Union uh, in, in a list of, of foes. Uh, we were perceived as a threat and we were in, uh, together in the same alliance in NATO. How can a military ally can be perceived as a threat? Uh, and sanctions were introduced on the seed production in Europe from the United States on the basis of a security assessment. That moment was a moment that was a quite a dramatic moment and was a moment where the Europeans realized that the, in their negotiations with China, as difficult as they were, they were alone. And this created a different mindset. This created different, I would say even psychological attitude. Um, the Chinese obviously played with it, that's obvious. Uh, so I'm sorry if I, if I uh, reconstructed a little bit of background, uh, recent history, but uh, you have to take that in mind to understand how relations between Europe and China developed from that moment onwards, because in that moment, it was Europe and not the US carrying the flag of those being hard on China. And then we realized that we were alone in doing this. Um, and, and you have also to keep in mind that Trump was uh, often moving uh, his position towards China uh, from will make a great deal to we are enemies forever, uh, which was not really a consistent message uh, to, to read uh, in, in Europe. Having said that, uh, from that moment onwards, uh, the relations between the European Union and China um, developed in, in a very complex manner. Uh, 
I, I would say that in, in some fields, the European Union uh, and China are real partners. And for sure, this is not the case uh, for, for the United States today. But I tell you the truth, uh, some of the things we have done, uh, regardless of the United States, uh, regardless of the Trump administration in these years, like, for instance, trying to preserve the nuclear deal with Iran, we couldn't have done that without China. Uh, all the work on climate change, we couldn't have done that without China. Uh, and on some files, China was a partner in the moment when the Trump administration was not. Uh, having said that, I think the European Union has taken a very pragmatic approach, very transparent, saying, okay, there are some issues, again, the nuclear file, um, uh, the climate change uh, uh, issues on which we can work with China and we have to work with China. There are other files on which we are competitors, clearly competitors, um, trade, uh, investments. And then there are other files on which uh, we are, the European Union is, even uses the, the term uh, systemic rivals. Uh, and on which there is no way in which the European Union and China uh, can agree. And the human rights uh, file is for sure the first of those, but not only that. Uh, so the Chinese didn't like it, uh, our uh, way of defining the complexity of our relationship, but then they lived with it. And I perfectly remember that uh, once uh, uh, a high level official uh, in China, uh, one of the top level officials in China told me, you know, we don't like the European Union in many respects, but at least with you, we know what we get. Uh, there's a certain level of predictability with, for the Chinese culture is uh, one of the essential elements of negotiating. So even things that we don't like about your positions on China, such as human rights issues, every time I went to China, I always met with human rights activists and that was accepted and that was uh, uh, a must for us. Uh, but the Chinese recognized that with the European Union, uh, negotiations could be serious and there, were, there was the capacity to differentiate sectors on which uh, competition or even uh, co conflict was uh, very hard and other issues on which cooperation was possible. So China might be seen as a kind of source of division or at least uh, divergent views from the outside. Uh, but we've also just recently observed uh, a major division from, so to speak, from inside, that is to say the departure of the UK from the uh, European, uh, from the European Union. Uh, the New York Times reports this morning that there are tensions and, and conflict over the distribution of uh, of vaccines that are produced in where you are in Belgium. Uh, but there are many other kinds of uh, implications, obviously, of the, uh, of the departure of the UK from the EU. So I wonder if you could comment a little bit on, you know, how that's working out um, and what are the implications for transatlantic relations? Yes, but well, first of all, it has been for us, I think, all uh, a very sad moment, uh, and including for many, uh, for many British um, people I know at all levels in institutions and outside of the institutions in academia, uh, our professors or here at the College of Europe, or even the students, we have an increasing number of students at the College of Europe uh, from the UK, which is an interesting signal, the fact that the younger generations wants to reinvest in uh, uh, in a possible commitment in the future with the European Union for the country. But uh, the ones that are more the sudden the most actually are the British um, about how the story went. Um, it was, uh, uh, it, it was uh, quite a dramatic choice on the European Union side. And it was also quite a dramatic negotiation afterwards. And I would say until the very last second, uh, a few weeks ago, uh, the risk of not having uh, an agreement uh, over Brexit uh, was exposing first and foremost, uh, the United Kingdom, but obviously also uh, Europe and the rest of the world to a very risky um, scenarios. Luckily, there has been an agreement at the end of the day, but still the points that remain open are many, are relevant need to be further negotiated and are uh, of critical importance. And the way in which the negotiations will continue 
uh, will determine um, the future of many sectors and in particular the economic cooperation, uh, the business environment. Um, I think of all the data protection file that is uh, exposing uh, businesses and, and the financial sector in the UK uh, to, to, to the risk of big damages and losses uh, if negotiations don't go well with the European Union, on, especially on, on data uh, protection, uh, but also on other things. Um, I, I believe that on the European perspective, um, if, if you go back with memory um, in your memory to uh, 2016, uh, that was indeed uh, quite a dramatic year. Um, you remember that the overall narrative was uh, that the Brexit referendum would have led to the end of the European Union. Many were referring to this as being the beginning of the end and that many other European Union member states would have uh, somehow emulated the UK and uh, would have chosen to go the same way with a referendum and exiting the Union. And actually the contrary happened. Uh, and I at the moment, I had no doubt this would have been the case. I come myself from a country that uh, from time to time cyclically plays with the idea of, uh, you know, um, getting out of the union or um, being very hard on, on the union. But one thing is to use the rhetoric of the anti-European feelings uh, in the public discourse, which is dangerous, I believe. But another thing is to get out for real. And all the other Europeans have seen how difficult and painful and how many consequences this has for a country like the UK, probably a country that we perceived all as being one of the strongest and most stable of the, of the European Union. And if the UK, for a country like the UK, it has been so painful and difficult, including on domestic dynamics, because seen from Europe, what is self-evident is that what is at stake in the future of the UK is the unity of the kingdom. With now Northern Ireland uh, and Ireland uh, having to discuss how to work together um, and possibly uh, a referendum on the unity of the island in the future. Scotland wishing to have a referendum on how to join the European Union alone. So the United Kingdom is not united anymore around this issue. And if a country solid like as the United Kingdom faces so many difficulties in getting out of the European Union, imagine what a nightmare would be for all the others. I think it had a deterrent effect on all the other Europeans. And I think the union is much stronger today, actually, even if we miss the UK, uh, that is much stronger today than it used to be because everybody has realized what there is to lose if they go that way. On transatlantic relations, I think that, uh, I guess that the, the the new administration will take a very pragmatic approach. Uh, you know, the United Kingdom is a key uh, ally, uh, first of all, uh, for security reasons for the United States, uh, is part of NATO, an important uh, NATO ally. Um, is, uh, um, there are historic and even family ties, if I can put it this way, uh, with the United Kingdom uh, and business and, and trade relations that are relevant, but still not as relevant as the ones that the United States has with the, with the European Union, uh, which remains uh, um, the, the, the most important uh, interlocutor uh, across the Atlantic. So I think there will be, um, again, very good relations with the European Union, with single European Union member states and good relations with uh, the UK. And I think in the UK, Boris Johnson is someone extremely uh, pragmatic as well. And I think that, uh, well, already now, uh, the discourse, the narrative that he uses uh, on, uh, on, uh, uh, on the US administration is different than the one he used uh, before. I mean, uh, everything is being recalibrated somehow because again, uh, considerations of uh, how relevant it is, uh, um, the transatlantic relation, including with the UK, uh, are, are predominant, I think. And again, for, for relations between the European Union and the UK, the better they will be, the better it will be for all of us and also for the rest of the world. That it, uh, these are things that are determined uh, on both sides of the, of the channel in this case and not of the Atlantic. And still we have a long way to go to find uh, a truly uh, uh, cooperative uh, full picture or full framework. We still miss some pieces of, uh, of the puzzle. Right, well, it's gonna take a while to sort itself out, no doubt. Um, 
So now here's a question regarding a country that is in a certain sense, both in and out. That is, it's not in the European Union, but it is in Europe, at least in part, and that is Russia. Um, Russia has been a complicated uh, sort of actor during the years of the Trump administration. Everyone knows that Trump had an odd kind of uh, deference to Mr. Putin. Um, you know, and yet it's in the news at the moment, mainly because of the rearrest of uh, its leading dissident who returned from recovering from a poison attack uh, for return from Germany. So I guess the question is, you know, how will the United States and Europe, uh, how should they, you know, uh, act and, and uh, sort of deal with uh, Russia in the, in the coming period? First of all, I think that uh, uh, I, I've seen that President Biden has called Putin, uh, I think, yesterday. Uh, and I think this has been a, a very important and good move uh, in the moment when, as you said, um, so many demonstrators and protesters are being arrested in Russia. Uh, a telephone call coming from not only Brussels and the European capitals, but also from Washington is a relevant uh, step. Uh, but also, um, as, as far as reports uh, tell us, uh, to discuss the, um, the, the expiry of uh, uh, the New START Treaty and uh, how to uh, prolong the effects of, uh, um, of uh, uh, arms control uh, agreements uh, between the United States and Russia. And I think this is a signal of an extremely um, uh, important, I think, and uh, hands-on uh, approach that this administration can have in our relations with, uh, with Russia. Um, this is for sure not an administration that needs time to, to, get, um, to get started. Uh, for sure, they, don't have the tr they didn't have the transition period properly used. Uh, but it's all people that know the files already and that uh, uh, in their first calls uh, are not going to have a round of introductory call calls. I, I think they're, they're down to business from day one. Uh, and, and with Russia, this is extremely important. Uh, for Europeans, uh, the, I would say that uh, the two or three key elements here will be um, first, a common approach on Ukraine uh, with the United States, between the European Union and the United States. Uh, because uh, to tell you the truth, in this last four years, uh, the European Union has been the one uh, supporting the survival of Ukraine uh, in the reform sector, uh, in the resilience mode that they have uh, tried to uh, develop. Uh, imagine that there has been no other country in the history of the European Union that has received a larger package of support. Uh, and financial support from the European Union ever. Ukraine is the single country that has received the largest envelope of, of financial support from the European Union in this last uh, six years. Uh, so uh, this to give you a sense of, uh, I would say hope and expectation that from now on we will share uh, the burden. We often talk about sharing the burden of, the, of our security. Uh, Europeans have I think often felt that security is not only military investments, sometimes it's also, uh, sometimes even humanitarian expenses can be an investment in security <laughs> or climate change can be an investment in security. And in this case for us, uh, Europeans uh, supporting financially the Ukrainian agenda and the Ukrainian reforms uh, and the, the survival of Ukraine as a country uh, has been part of our investment in security. Uh, and again, this is not part of the um, GDP percentage we spend on, on military equipment, but it is part of our collective security. So I think that uh, on, on our side, there is an expectation on the European side, there is an expectation that from now on, um, consultation on, as I said, Ukraine uh, and uh, uh, how to deal with uh, that conflict will be uh, done properly between the European Union and the United States. Um, I think that uh, an expectation is there also that on the entire non-proliferation and arms control file, uh, there will be a very active uh, US, uh, active and coordinated with the Europeans position. I have to say on this, uh, um, the Iran nuclear deal, uh, maybe the Korean file, um, the presence of Wendy Sherman uh, in the State Department, if confirmed, obviously uh, gives Europeans a, a, a hint of the fact that this is going to be for sure on the agenda. 
um, that is in general terms, I would say, and, and in, on these files uh, relating to Russia is not irrelevant, uh, both for the bilateral relations between the and treaties between the United States and Russia, but also because on uh, uh, on arms control and nuclear non-proliferation, um, a dialogue between the United States and Russia is indispensable. Uh, there is no way to substitute it. Uh, because of the nature of the military uh, presence of, uh, well, part of it from the past, but part of it also uh, for, for now. So I would expect that this would be um, key or at least present in, in the talks. Um, and also on some uh, other issues where uh, for Europeans, it will be extremely important to coordinate with the United States in the Security Council. Um, this has not happened so um, that much uh, from in the last years, uh, if at all. Um, the European Union member states uh, that are permanent members now are less because the UK left, but uh, between uh, the UK and uh, the European Union member states present in the Security Council of the United Nations, for sure there will be and there will continue to be a form of coordination on the key files. I think of the Middle East peace process, I think of Syria, I think of, uh, um, of uh, um, the main conflicts and crises we have around the world, Sahel, the Horn of Africa, uh, Ukraine itself. And I think that having the United States coordinating with the Europeans, uh, not only with the Europeans, but mainly with the Europeans in the Security Council will also make a difference on the outcome of some global uh, negotiations on security issues. So the question you've raised the question of European security, which is inevitable in the discussion of Russia, um, but uh, it raises the question of NATO, and which you've mentioned in passing, but not really uh, gone into any detail about. And I wonder, I mean, famously, the first Secretary General of NATO, Lord Ismay, said NATO was created to keep the Soviets out, the Americans in, and the Germans down. Uh, but that world is in many ways gone, right? Um, uh, I mean, there may be a concern about keeping the Americans in on the basis of the experience of the last four years, but I guess it raises the question, you know, what is the contemporary yeah. relevance of, uh, of NATO and, and, you know, how should it be structured going forward? Yes, I think uh, this is one of the reasons personally, it is one of the reasons why um, I am so happy to see uh, this administration coming in, because I've seen with my, own, my, with my own eyes how NATO has suffered in this last four years uh, for a lack of uh, engagement or, or even for a lack of consistency or clarity uh, from, from the US administration. Uh, I was present at the NATO summit in, uh, in Brussels where uh, Trump, uh, um, sent op opposing messages, op op completely different messages from literally from one hour to the other, uh, and leaders in the room were completely lost on what the real intentions of the United States were um, on, on the alliance, on the future of the alliance. Uh, and for a military alliance, uh, this is particularly um, uh, serious and, and, and uh, heavy. Uh, because there is nothing as precious as predictability in the military domain. Um, and, and we have always uh, sensed and seen that uh, the Pentagon has always struggled to, to keep a face of, uh, of consistency and, and engagement. Uh, and then from time to time, uh, there was a different message coming from a different telephone number. <laughs> if I can continue to use the Kissinger metaphor, um, sending contradicting messages. So. Uh, if the Europeans have uh, a feeling of relief uh, for, for, the, um, for the new administration, I think that NATO has a feeling of relief even more than, than the European Union. Uh, because as you mentioned, um, this is the moment uh, for NATO to rethink its mission, its core uh, identity, I would say, and DNA. It is true that some traditional security threats are still uh, present and uh, uh, currently um, need attention, uh, not only keeping the Americans in, I have no doubt that the United States will stay in, uh, again, because the United States has a solid Pentagon, and uh, uh, this has always been also in this last four years, a guarantee somehow, um, and militaries are, are serious people, uh, normally they, they don't play with words, uh, if, if, um, uh, if they do it, uh, it's, uh, it's because there's a clear uh, intention behind that, but uh, uh, 
the risk of, uh, you know, uh, an aggressive Russia, including uh, territorially aggressive Russia for Europeans is a real risk. We have countries that have long borders uh, with an aggressive Russia. We have countries in Europe that uh, are presently um, experiencing conflict uh, and, uh, and war on their own territories. Think of Ukraine, uh, think of Georgia. I mean, it was just 2008 when we had the major crisis in Georgia. Uh, it's not that long ago. Um, the, there is uh, in Europe a perception of a threat that still can come from that side. Uh, and so we need to keep for sure the traditional approach of uh, uh, territorial defense for which NATO is, uh, is absolutely irreplaceable. But in the meantime, NATO is in, the, in, in this moment uh, looking at how to reinvent uh, and to update uh, its own mission on the new security threats that sometimes are even more worrying than the traditional ones. Climate change, for the first time, a military alliance like NATO includes climate change as a security threat. And this administration will for sure be the best partner and ally to invest in that direction. And I'm sure John Kerry will do an excellent job on this. Uh, but also uh, cyber attacks, uh, hybrid threats, uh, the entire um, domain of uh, how the digital world uh, can be uh, or can become or can turn into a security threat. Uh, how can our data uh, be manipulated uh, for um, a use that is not appropriate? Uh, and how can that lead to a security threat for our countries, for our societies even? Uh, so I think that in this reflection about what does it mean security today for a military alliance, as well as for the more traditional ones, Russia, but also uh, Afghanistan, uh, where we are together still. Uh, I think that having the Biden administration in office and engaged will be 100% making the difference uh, for NATO. Europeans are on board. Thank you. Um, I mean, I guess I wanna ask one more question and then open it up to questions and answers from the audience. Um, so I wanna encourage people in the audience to send in your questions now uh, using the Q&A function. Uh, but one last question from me uh, concerns a country that is uh, again, sort of not exactly in, but might once have been in and that's Turkey. Uh, for a long time, it was sort of taken for granted that Turkey was a candidate member of the EU and, you know, sooner or later, it would meet certain benchmarks and milestones and would be admitted. And that now seems in many ways a kind of a distant past. Um, Turkey has gone in a very different direction. It's sort of turned away from Europe. It's a regional and in some ways, you know, uh, as the Germans would say, above regional kind of power. Um, but its interest in joining the European Union seems to have waned and uh, Europe's interest in letting them in also seems uh, correspondingly to have uh, uh, waned. So I wonder uh, how you see the relationship with Turkey developing. It's after all such an important country in that part of the world. And also on this, um, who sits in, uh, in the White House uh, and, uh, and in the State Department and in the Pentagon is not irrelevant because uh, talking about NATO, uh, Turkey is not only um, uh, a neighbor for, for Europeans, it's also partially a European country, but it's also a key NATO ally. And if you think of all the work we have uh, been doing in the past on Syria, for instance, uh, without, uh, without Turkey in NATO, um, things have, would have been different. Uh, so, uh, not to mention the fact that we still have a conflict ongoing in, in Cyprus. Uh, so there are issues and elements of friction uh, on which the positioning of Washington will make a difference, uh, will, uh, uh, will change the course of uh, uh, actions and perceptions. Personally, I think uh, I was, uh, it's interesting, I was discussing uh, just today with, um, with a Turkish student uh, we have many Turkish students that join the College of Europe uh, uh, because the younger generation uh, um, is uh, very much interested in seeing if the possible accession of Turkey to the European Union is not only of a distant past, um, but also of a distant future. Uh, they are interested in, in, in looking at the possibilities of uh, revitalizing 
um, the, the path that could eventually potentially lead uh, Turkey to, to enter the European Union. It seems so improbable and, and, uh, and unlikely today. Uh, but uh, if, uh, if the 20, 25, uh, 30 years old generation in Turkey starts uh, reflecting on this and, and preparing for this, we might have a chance to, to have a different Turkey in the future. Uh, for the European Union, I think, uh, yeah, it was clear at a certain moment, Turkey took a different path, uh, in particular on human rights and rule of law. This has been the turning point, uh, the moment when Erdogan started to um, to, to deviate from the common um, traditionally set uh, of, uh, uh, by the way, principles and standards that we share in the Council of Europe, because that's not only the European Union, that's the Council of Europe of which Turkey is a member, and that is mainly focusing on human rights and rule of law, the role of judiciary, uh, respect of parliamentary minority. I mean, uh, these are the most serious elements that have taken Turkey away uh, from, from the European path. Uh, offered the European Union accession path. This might be reversible in the future. Formally, Turkey stays a, a candidate country, but uh, again, um, negotiations are suspended and uh, I don't see any possibility of revitalizing them unless and until there will be a change of, uh, a radical change of uh, uh, attitudes on the issues of uh, uh, human rights and rule of law uh, in, in Turkey. Having said that, I also think that a positive agenda with Turkey, uh, beyond the perspectives uh, for membership to the European Union, is possible and desirable. First of all, because we're neighbors. First of all, because we share some of the security threats of our region uh, in the Mediterranean, in the Middle East. But also because, as I mentioned, the Cyprus issue at a certain moment will require to be solved. And it cannot be solved without Turkey actively contributing to solving it. And so I hope uh, this, this is not something impossible to happen, I think, in the future. I hope that uh, a US administration might help us uh, in the context of considering Turkey as a key NATO ally uh, to, to, to define a new kind of environment, a new kind of atmosphere in which a little bit more of cooperation and a little bit less of confrontation is possible uh, with Turkey. And again, it's not just between Turkey and the European Union is uh, between Turkey and, um, uh, and uh, I would say, uh, what we traditionally refer to as the Western world. It's not an expression I like, but it, it sensitizes well the, uh, the, the set of values we, we live for. Um, it was more difficult to use this expression a few weeks ago, but uh, now, now it's <laughs> safe again. Uh, so it, the moment when Turkey comes back, I would say to the community of values that we've always shared, uh, I think that then, um, again, both the perspective of uh, coming in the Union and also more cooperative approach in the East uh, part of the Mediterranean, starting from the Cyprus issue, uh, might be very much possible and desirable. Okay, thank you. Um, maybe now we can turn to some questions from the audience. Um, the first one is um, as follows, from a European perspective, does the prospective appointment of Tony Blinken and especially Victoria Nuland suggest that the U.S. might return to the regi regime change business? And how would a more anti-Russian American policy be received in Europe? I wouldn't define uh, the previous U.S., uh, the previous, previous U.S. policy as a regime change approach. Um, I think that some lessons of the past have been learned. Um, some thinking has been done, I think, on some of the limits uh, or the mistakes even uh, that we might have uh, done uh, together, including from the European side in some moments. For instance, uh, on Russia, um, well, first of all, um, the European Union still has uh, sanctions on Russia. Um, actually tougher than the United States. So uh, at this stage, uh, the EU policy on Russia is much tougher than the United States one. So uh, I, don't, I don't think that this will be perceived as a problem if the United States take a stronger um, stand on, on Russia. Uh, it would actually be welcomed. Um, but I think that in the European Union, in Europe in general, we have realized one thing. Uh, that I think our, um, our friends, and, and starting from Tony Blinken and, and Vittorio Luna, Nuland also uh, might have reflected upon in, this, uh, in these years. And this is the fact that 
uh, for instance, when you think of Maidan, uh, of, of the demonstrations in Ukraine in, in early 2014, uh, in that moment, um, the narrative that Russia was playing uh, was that uh, the Europeans and the Americans were pushing Ukraine to a choice uh, on one side or the other. You can be either with Russia or with the West. And for a country with a social and ethnic and linguistic composition and even religious composition uh, as Ukraine, as many other Eastern European countries, uh, this approach of uh, uh, choosing sides uh, is problematic because history and even literature or, or poetry or, or as I said, religion uh, makes it so that uh, uh, a choice can be easily, or pushing for a choice can be easily uh, manipulated or instrumentalized by the Russian Federation for aggressive purposes. And I think that from that moment, we realized at least in Europe, we changed the narrative and our partnership with what we call our Eastern partners, uh, Ukraine, but also Moldova or Georgia, um, but even Armenia, Azerbaijan or Belarus uh, is, uh, is an approach not of, of telling them you need to choose if you're friends of Russia or if you're friends of Europe. It's an approach that says, this, are, this is our set of values. This is how our democracies work. This is how we empower our civil society. This is how we guarantee the independence of the judiciary. This is how we, um, we guarantee that our uh, media uh, sector is free and independent. This is what we can do together to try and start reforms, uh, but also uh, economic investments and, and trade relations between the European Union and your country. This doesn't imply becoming an enemy of Russia. This doesn't imply breaking all the ties you have with Russia, uh, but this is what is on our side. This is clearly what is on the table from our side. And avoiding to enter into uh, the binary choice uh, discourse. Uh, I think that this narrative has proven to be much more productive in practical terms, allowing these countries that want to reform, that want to have uh, a more European standard oriented society and economy and institution to engage in that process without allowing the Russian Federation to use the identity argument uh, inside the societies themselves. Uh, I don't know if I managed to express myself properly, but I think that this has been a thinking that for sure in Europe has developed. And I think that, uh, uh, that the same kind of reasoning might, uh, might have happened also uh, in some of our American friends. Thank you very much. So- I can, I can. this is true right. only for, for um, countries in the East of Europe, but also for Central Asia. Mm -hmm. that is experiencing exactly the same kind of uh, dynamic, a search for uh, uh, reforms and investments uh, on, the, on the model of the European uh, style uh, without breaking completely the cultural identity ties, starting from the language ties uh, with uh, what has always been the history. Right. So could you please address uh, how the EU uses migration partnerships as part of the foreign policy? How does the EU reconcile the human rights violations directly connected to EU migration deterrence, particularly in the Mediterranean and Africa? What a question. This has been one of the fights on which uh, uh, I have personally suffered the most during my years in office. I think there's no mystery because I think I said it even publicly a couple of times. Um, first of all, um, on a personal note, um, when I arrived in Brussels, um, I was, uh, I, I resigned as, a, uh, as an Italian foreign minister the day before starting in Brussels. So I was coming straight from uh, the member state that was at the time more exposed to, to um, migratory flows. Uh, and uh, I, I was shocked when I arrived in Brussels, finding out that migration for the European Union was a purely internal uh, file. There was no external uh, competence on, on migration uh, put in place whatsoever, uh, as if migration was happening from where. Uh, so we started developing partnerships with countries of origin and transit. Um, for me, 
there were two aspects here, uh, and, and there still are. On one side, uh, I think Europe has been not living up to its own standards when it came to respect of human rights and promotion and protection of human rights uh, related to the management of migration and refugee flows. I personally felt a deficit on the European side on that. And that created to me some, some cautious problem. Uh, on the other side, and this was mainly linked, I think, to the domestic political uh, fights inside the member states. This issue has always been so highly politicized, particularly by the right-wing parties and the extreme right-wing parties or governments, that sometimes you had the impression that they didn't even want to solve the problem because they needed to use the problem electorally. Uh, that was my impression from, from, from time to time. And uh, I found it extremely painful to see this in Europe. Uh, and I've always admitted that in Europe, on the migration file, on the refugee treatment, we had a lot and a long way to go to have full respect and full promotion and protection of human rights. I think we have a there. Uh, on the other side, um, what we put in place and is still in place with the countries of origin and transit was on the contrary, uh, something uh, extremely valuable and positive because the, the agreements that were established with the countries of origin and transit were done together with the UN agencies. So it, it is all trilateral agreements between the European Union, countries of origin and transit and UNHCR and IOM. In some cases also including international NGOs, for instance, on the respect and the protection of uh, particular categories of, uh, uh, of refugees and migrants, um, or uh, even sometimes training local forces on how to protect human rights uh, in countries where protection of human rights is not yet, let's put it this way, a priority. Um, and also trying to invest on uh, uh, regular channels on one side, dismantling of criminal networks and, and criminal organizations and developing local economic uh, opportunities so that uh, the flows of economic forced migration could be prevented. I think that the combination of this with a huge investment uh, from an economic but also from a political point of view was positive. This is, I think, that the external partnerships is exactly the way forward. And this is why the UN actually was very much happy to see the European Union engaging finally into this. Basically, a cooperation aimed at developing opportunities on the ground and opening regular and legal channels for migration to come into Europe without putting these people in the hands of criminal organizations um, that traffic human beings uh, as they traffic drugs or, or arms. The, of this, actually, I have always been very proud as much as I have not been proud of the way in which internally uh, in some cases, some European Union member states in particular have treated migrants and refugees. I hope I've answered in a very uh, transparent and open manner, or at least that this is this is uh, an answer to the to the question that was put. I don't think our questioner could have cause for complaint with that answer. Thank you very much. So here's a very interesting question: When Angela Merkel steps down this year. How do you anticipate her absence will impact EU leadership? She's been there for 16 years. What well, next? Well, uh, it's a German, uh, it's it's a German uh, issue, but it's also a European issue. And it, my my guess is that uh, my impression uh, it's more than a guess. Uh, for sure, she would be missed, but uh, the European Union is uh, such a a structured, complex, uh, I would say solid uh, building that for sure individuals are missed, uh, but uh, nobody is indispensable or irreplaceable. Uh, so for sure her leadership will be missed. In particular, I think her leadership will be missed in the EPP, in the um, uh, uh, People's Party, in the conservative uh, side of the uh, political landscape in Europe because uh, she has been uh, for sure, and she still is, 
uh, a point of reference for uh, all those conservatives in Europe that have a very pro-European uh, stand. And that has created a, 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 a somehow a, a limit to the extreme right. Uh, she has been the one that for me has been the most forcefully pushing back uh, the extreme rights attempts in Europe uh, to come to the center of the political landscape. Uh, she has been the origin for that. Uh, after her, I hope that the, 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 the conservative camp in Europe and in Germany will be as strong as she has been in pushing back uh, these temptations of going uh, more on the far right uh, that have been present in other leaders or in other countries. Uh, on that side, so more on the political dynamics, on the party, politics, uh, she will be missed. On the institutional level, I think, yes, for sure she will be missed, but again, uh, the structure and the, the, the architecture is solid enough to absorb any one uh, leaving. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure that uh, there will be other leaders uh, taking the place. But again, on the, on the party politics side, uh, I think she will be missed. Understood. So- and I'm, I'm, I'm talking as an observer there. Of course, of course. So uh, you mentioned in your response to that question, the far right, and a questioner asks uh, about the role of transnational far right, you know, relationships and how they may affect the transatlantic relationship between the United States and the European Union. Is there, how does that work in terms of the impact that it may have on the relationship? It does, it does a lot. Uh, and uh, I, I can tell you uh, the years of the Trump administration, uh, the extreme right in Europe was uh, uh, definitely uh, uh, not only growing, but uh, feeling uh, you know, empowered. Uh, that is without any doubt. Uh, all across the European Union, all across Europe, I would say, uh, the extreme right uh, uh, political leaders uh, had, uh, had a good point in, in saying, you know, uh, once Trump is in the White House, we can be in, in government uh, everywhere because uh, uh, there's no taboo anymore. Uh, all doors are open. Uh, we can as well. Uh, and this was uh, uh, used in, in the political campaigns, in the electoral campaigns uh, in all European countries, uh, including, uh, including Bannon uh, living in, in Europe for some time, uh, advising uh, far right, uh, extreme right uh, uh, movements in Europe. On, uh, on electoral strategies or political communication strategies without any, any, um, uh, any uh, problem. And uh, I, if, if you scroll the, 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 the Twitter accounts of the uh, extreme right political leaders, uh, you will find plenty of their picture with Trump um, before he became a president or, or after that in some cases. So for sure, and, and for sure this is not over. Uh, we know in Europe that uh, uh, in, in the, uh, somebody is calling, but it's not me. Uh, in the United States, uh, the um, uh, well, uh, the extreme right, or as the president uh, uh, mentioned, put it uh, or described it uh, in in his inaugural speech, uh, uh, the white supremacy movement uh, is uh, is. Uh, uh, alive and kicking, uh, and, and even literally kicking. Uh, and the scenes we have seen in Capitol Hill are have been dramatic for Europeans because we um, last time we have seen, uh, uh, as uh, as uh, Arden Schwarzenegger mentioned, the last time we've seen um, scenes like this in Europe uh, was uh, uh, in other times and, and very sad times for European history. Um, we know that there are links, we know that there are bonds, we know that they're going to support each other reciprocally. Uh, and uh, uh, this is, I think, an extremely worrying uh, trend uh, that I hope we will manage to, to counter in an effective manner, not only from an institutional point of view, not only from a judiciary point of view, because I think there are uh, legal uh, and, uh, and judicial implications to, this, uh, to these actions, by the way, uh, today is the Holocaust uh, Memorial Day, uh, so let me also spend one word on this because I think that we have the, the duty and the responsibility to remember because it can happen again. Uh, and we've seen that uh, uh, awful things of the past uh, can happen again uh, if we are not paying attention to preventing them from happening. Uh, 
but I think that the main point, uh, the main, uh, um, uh, the main uh, uh, task, the main challenge we will all have across the Atlantic and together with others in the world uh, is to try and, uh, um, and uh, increase the antibodies that our society has uh, or should have uh, to, to react and to isolate and to respond uh, to, to this kind of movements and uh, to avoid that they can grow. Uh, because it starts from, from a societal movement or from a transnational movement and then it comes up to the institutional level. And again, even if in the United States today is not at the institutional level, um, it can come back on the institutional level in the United States or elsewhere in the world, including in Europe. And we have to be extremely careful uh, to this possibility because it, it's dangerous. We've seen it as dangerous for our democracies, even for our economies, uh, if we want to be extremely pragmatic. Um, and uh, uh, most of all, it's dangerous for our citizens and for the people of our countries. Of course. But needless to say, the images from Capitol Hill were shocking for Amer most Americans as well. Um, so uh, apropos the Holocaust, uh, we have a question concerning an institution that came into being after World War II, you know, that was designed essentially to uh, mitigate international conflicts of the kind that had just ended, namely the United Nations. And the question basically is, you know, what about the transatlantic partnership can contribute to strengthening the UN? Oh, can do a lot. I think that number two, uh, after the Secretary General of NATO, I think that the person uh, that is the most uh, relieved and, uh, in, from the change of administration might be Secretary General of the United Nations. Uh, the United Nations uh, have a lot of things to change um, and uh, um, uh, definitely requires and needs uh, profound revisions, reforms, uh, all aspects, uh, and has many shortcomings. Uh, but uh, as democracy, um, we've not invented anything better than that for the moment. And uh, uh, having the United States uh, re-engaging in the UN and its agencies, um, it's key for the UN to work, uh, for the UN to be financed, uh, and for the European Union to have a partner to work with inside the UN same system. Uh, what I can share with you is that in this last four years, many times the European Union has had to uh, jump in and uh, finance uh, actions or agencies or even humanitarian needs uh, by the way, in some cases, humanitarian needs signaled by uh, the World Food Program, uh, directed by a US citizen and also close to the president at the time, uh, the, the European Union has had to jump in and, and uh, literally pay the bill um, that the United States were not paying anymore uh, or keep agencies alive uh, that were risking to die because of the withdrawal of the United States from their actions. And the UN system repeatedly in this last four years has, the United Nations has turned towards the European Union to fill the vacuum that the United States uh, had, uh, had left. So now for sure, there will be the possibility to um, work together in the UN system. Again, not to keep it as it is, but to reform it towards a more effective UN system. But if you have an instrument like the UN uh, that needs to be reformed, but cannot be in this moment replaced because there is no alternative at the moment to that kind of, of organization. And actually you have a growing need for global governance, not a diminishing one in the world of today. You, we see it with the pandemic, we see it with climate change. So you had an increased need for uh, effective global governance. You have an institution that is old, but is in place. The EU and the United States coming together at this stage with others can be the only option for having an effective reform of the UN system that can allow us to have the instruments to cope with and to deal with and possibly to prevent uh, global crisis or, or global uh, problems. Uh, look at uh, uh, the pandemic. It was a self-evident uh, uh, need to have a global uh, action on, on this because the virus knows no limits, no borders. It's not a national or local uh, issue. 
And if you don't defeat it everywhere in the world, it will come back again to you, even if you think you're, you're immune. You have to solve it globally. So you need the UN to act uh, effectively. And I believe really that uh, the European Union and the United States uh, can be the engines together of these reforms. And on the security and peace um, uh, files, um, have to work together uh, in the framework of the United Nations. I think of Syria, I think of the Middle East peace process, completely forgotten, lost. Uh, I think of uh, the many African conflicts uh, that are so dangerous for many of us. Uh, I think of Libya, uh, I think of all this Venezuela, all this um, forgotten uh, crisis on which uh, without a UN framework and a US EU cooperation, there's no way uh, to see any solution at sight. Thank you. So one final question, which is essentially the merging of two questions that I have, um, and it has to do basically with the EU's ability to influence democratic transformation and the uh, enforcement of the rule of law in various parts of Eastern and Southeastern Europe, Be Belarus, Kosovo, Albania, North Macedonia, what, what kind of tools does the EU have for countries that are not you know, currently part of the EU and that you know, aren't really going to be part of it anytime soon? Well, uh, um, thanks for the question. It's an excellent one. Uh, there's a lot uh, of instruments that the European Union has uh, that uh, are extremely powerful and effective, I believe. Um, First of all, some of these countries uh, that you mentioned uh, uh, might, uh, and I hope will, uh, get inside the Union at a certain moment. Some of them are already in the process of uh, uh, negotiating their, their membership. And this is the most powerful uh, instrument uh, for uh, transformation uh, in these countries, because uh, as you negotiate the accession to the European Union, First of all, you have access to a lot of funds that can finance the reform processes in all different sectors, in particular, the rule of law, judiciary, uh, corruption, uh, but also civil society um, and, uh, and rule of law in general, uh, but also economic reforms. I think of uh, uh, infrastructures, connectivity. Um, literally, you w once you enter the process of uh, uh, negotiating accession to the European Union, you have an old set of standards to be met, processes and timelines to, to get there and financial resources and human resources to accompany you on the road. So this is the most effective way to transform societies uh, from within uh, with the buy-in, with the ownership of uh, the population and the local leadership. So uh, this is for sure the most transformative instrument we have in the European Union. But there are also other instruments that are extremely helpful and powerful. Uh, well, one of the effective ones, I believe, is the association agreements, is what the European Union has signed uh, with Ukraine, uh, Moldova and uh, Georgia. Uh, there are, and that includes in, in most cases, uh, in all cases, um, trade agreements. And this includes agreements on uh, economic cooperation, on technical cooperation. Uh, again, a very tight reform agenda, uh, mainly on the public sector, but also on, on some parts of the private sector and a lot of resources. Uh, the uh, other uh, countries um, that you mentioned, Belarus, but also uh, here I would refer to Armenia and Azerbaijan, uh, other are in the process of negotiating other kinds of agreements uh, or have already signed them that are lighter in the sense that uh, they're not associated uh, to the European Union, but offer a framework of both economic cooperation uh, a society to society, a people to people aspect, uh, exchanges, students exchanges, uh, civil society empowerment, media, uh, joint work, uh, support to the international media sector, uh, to the independent media sector, for instance, uh, trade agreements uh, or uh, customs uh, uh, agreements um, that uh, uh, are beneficial for the societies twice. On one side, because they incentivize reforms and on the other side, and sometimes they finance reforms. And on the other side, uh, because they increase the economic uh, relations and the trade relations with, uh, um, with uh, the, uh, the European Union. And then even far away from Europe, uh, I was mentioning Central Asia before, uh, all the countries of Central Asia have some form of uh, uh, partnership or uh, agreement with the European Union that includes some elements of those. 
Uh, and all of them are very much willing and looking forward to increase this level of cooperation because they're looking for diversification. They're squeezed between China and Russia and they look for European standards to find a way out of this uh, geopolitical game. Um, and uh, even if they're not uh, uh, geographically uh, connected uh, uh, or, or adjacent uh, to, to the European Union territories, uh, they are all uh, extremely interested in increasing uh, level of partnership and cooperation. And this has always elements of transformative power when it comes to reforms. And again, in particular, I underline um, economic reforms, but also institutional, uh, starting from human rights, rule of law and, and judiciary. And also looking south, sorry, and then I'll, I'll stop here, uh, looking south uh, at the southern um, shore of the Mediterranean, uh, also with Northern African countries and with Middle Eastern countries, uh, the European Union has agreements uh, and partnerships, uh, structured ones that have supported in these years, especially after the so-called Arab Springs, uh, the uh, reforms uh, inside these countries uh, more or less successfully, it varies a lot from country to country, but in all these countries there, is, um, there are um, association dialogues and uh, ministerial meetings and leaders meetings and summits. In between there is uh, an, an official's uh, work uh, to reform profoundly different sectors of this country. So there is a, a, there is a lot there is actually much more than it, it is perceived and it is seen and visible in place. And this brings me to, 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 to saying something that I've always said, and uh, people normally looked at me uh, as if I was completely crazy, but uh, if you took away the European Union and all its international engagement and instruments, uh, if you took away all of this for even one day only, the world would literally collapse. You take away all the humanitarian aid, all the development aid, all the trade agreements, all the human rights dialogues, all the um, reforms processes. You take away all of that, even for 24 hours, I couldn't count the number of people that would die out of it or the number of processes that would stop. We don't sometimes realize it because we give it for granted. We've always done it, we continue to do it and it's a life-saving life mode somehow for, for many. Uh, but uh, I think this is really uh, the most powerful instrument the European Union has, this transformative normative power also uh, that is so precious for us. Indeed. Well, thank you very much. I, I want to say thank you so much to Federica Mogherini, the former High Representative for Foreign and Security Policy of the European Union and currently Rector of the College of Europe, where she's training future versions of herself, I think. Um, and so many students from our, abroad. So um, I hope that we will be able to welcome some of, uh, uh, of your students uh, in the future in, uh, uh, in Bruges or in Warsaw. Uh, it would be great to see more, uh, especially more American students joining. I'm hoping to send my daughter who's Belgian, but that's another Thanks. conversation. <laughs> um, I also want to thank the Otto and Fran Walter Foundation for their steadfast support of this lecture series and of the activities of the European Union Studies Center more generally. Robin Garrell of the uh, Graduate Center, president of the Graduate Center, and everyone who helped make this event uh, such a success. Thank you so much. And this will, by the way, be posted online in the very near future. I uh, can't say exactly when, but look for it soon. Okay, thank you all very much. Thank you to the audience for coming and we look forward to seeing you again. Be well. Arrivederci. Arrivederci. <laughs>